done with now. So um, if I'm hoping other people will join us, but if not, let's let's start. Um, we have two purposes for being here today. One is we are required to under to by uh, federal rules do annual updates on our report. Um, you will recall that we have um, sent out, we've had prior meetings where we have asked everybody to give us whatever updates they have done. I'd like to thank President Hanbury because we received, I think, more updates from NOVA than everybody else combined, uh, <laughs> depending on whether you consider yeah. NOVA and the Levan Center as one organization, because we received separate from both NOVA and from the Levan Center. Um, and um, so first, we're going to review and adopt this. And then the other thing is we have just I've, I've been in government since 1988, so 35 years. I've served on a lot of Blue Ribbon committees. This one was the bluest of the Blue Ribbons, and I am reluctant to let this or, uh, committee go to waste. So the second thing is we have a couple of topics that we're going to uh, propose that we start to work on one of them. So let me at this. Yes. Yes. Just wanted to point out, uh, Mr. Hudson is new. He's subbing for uh, Juliet Rulak. No, he's he's here. replacing. Yeah, uh, uh, Mr. Sorry. Steve. Steve, yeah. at least the, uh, the yes. you are currently the president of the workshop, aren't you? Yes, currently chair of the uh, broad workshop. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay. Right. Yes. Oh, I'm not sure if that's no, something you congratulate or give condolences <laughs> for. Steve is a very, was a very busy man before this, and now with the workshop, it's you know you one of these things that you say. Do we congratulate you on taking on all of this additional unpaid work, or extend our sympathies? Uh, but it is uh, I'm sure it's a great you, honor. It's a great honor, and you know, I, you know we've uh, I know by reputation all of the good things you do, and I'm sure we'll. You'll be will be thrilled with with having you on here. So I'm just to, to be here, just to bring anybody everybody else up to date, we had um, the SEDS. It's a comprehensive economic development strategy, and we are the economic development agency the district district DDD for Southeast Florida of the Economic Development Administration of the U.S. Department of Commerce. Did I get this oh, right? Okay, right. <laughs> so we are required to do every five years a comprehensive survey. I will tell you that the product that we put out on the uh, economy of Southeast Florida, I think is I do not believe any SEDs in the country could have matched what we did. And certainly I've seen some of the others from Florida and I know that none of them did. So um, we did great work. Uh, we thank staff for that. Oh, and, yeah. and it was really also because we had so many blue ribbon leaders on this. We had university presidents, uh, I think we had four yes. university presidents. Uh, we have the economic development groups from Monroe, Dade, Broward. I don't know if Palm Beach was on. Palm Beach is not part of the South Florida Regional Planning Council. We are Monroe, Dade, and Broward. But a lot of the economic numbers included Palm Beach that we weren't able to always break out. Um, so this is the, and, and uh, can we make sure that we send uh, Chair Hudson a copy yes. of last year's SEDS? Yes. Uh, it's only 120, 130 pages, just, you know, light reading when you have nothing else to, or when you need to go to sleep and you can't, you know, you can take a look at that. This is our first update, and let me introduce, because I don't know if all of you know, our new deputy director, uh, who is also our, what's your other titles? 
Chief oh, of Staff. Chief of Staff and Director of Economic yeah. Development and Research. Chief of Staff and Director of Economic Development Research. We poached him from the <laughs> Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council. So, Randy <laughs> DeShazzo, if you can give us the update. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. So, the uh, official title for the report is uh, the annual uh, progress report, but annual update uh, works. It's a data focused snapshot of what's changed in the past year or since the last reporting period. It is not an update of policies per se. On the other hand, the document is important to the Economic Development Administration because it helps them track what the shifting priorities are. Uh, and what, what are the emerging issues? And as such, it's important, uh, not just for our region, but to also help uh, the, the EDA think through where, where the region is going. And by the way, for those of you that are applying for grants, if your project is something that is identified in the SEDS, and or meets the policy goals of the SEDS that you can refer to, you get brownie points, uh, you know, yeah. super bonus points from U.S. Department of Commerce when they're reviewing grant applications. So it's important. Yeah. All right. So um, as a report focused on annual changes, there are some kinds of changes that we... Uh, I was, I was going to just make a suggestion. Maybe you want to be at the podium. Yeah, sure. And then Alicia can help with moving the slides. Just that way people can see. That way people can see you as opposed to a disembodied voice. I like being there. <laughs> All right. So um, on, on the one hand, an annual update is, is very helpful on the, uh, but we still need to both keep a mind or keep our eyes on short term changes as well as long-term trends as they inevitably come back to haunt us. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize here uh, is that the whole point of this, again, is to uh, help advance our regional economic goals. Go, go to the next one. So in this report that I'm doing today, the area that uh, those titles that are in red are what's specifically included in the SEDS. And then some of these other pieces I'm going to talk about as, as companion pieces to what we focus on in the annual progress report. Uh, generally speaking, uh, South Florida has outperformed the United States, both on unemployment and in employment growth. Uh, and uh, there are a number of factors we're going to talk about uh, leading into the annual report. So if you'll just go ahead and move forward. Uh, one of them is, of course, the change that's occurred in inflation. As you all know, there was a lot of concern with inflation in the last several years. There are, of course, various ways of measuring uh, the inflation rate. Um, but what we look at here is the consumer price index, which is really relevant to our area because the housing, cost of housing is such a large share of the basket of goods that they look at to create the index. So the chart on the left is the United States, where you see inflation has uh, trebled since 1982. And uh, on the right-hand side, we're uh, even higher than that in the Miami, uh, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm, MSA, which is where we're really benchmarking a lot of our things against, which is, again, that, that's uh, 340 or three, almost three and a half times what prices were uh, in, the, in the 80s when the index is based on a, a score of 100. And there are a lot of drivers here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, uh, but we all know what a lot of these are. The snarled supply chains help drive up costs. And of course, here, uh, there is a the, um, the doubling down effect of uh, ever expanding gaps between uh, housing and wages, housing costs and wages. Uh, so the next one, uh, some of the long-term uh, trends that we, we need to kind of keep in mind is just how much supply chains have also reorganized since COVID uh, ended. Uh, we now have 24 seven shopping uh, and we have much more complex supply chains that have been optimized, but they also have a lot of indirect impacts uh, that we also see rolling over into how our uh, approach to office work has also changed. Uh, so that a lot of employers are now struggling with how to bring employees back to the office. 
uh, and then on top of that, there are also local effects because of the disappearing office worker. So like many large urban areas, this is a map of uh, vacant buildings in downtown Minneapolis, but a lot of these uh, cases of vacancy rates are very severe in San Francisco and some of the other tech hubs around the country where downtowns are emptying out uh, and that's affecting local businesses. The downtown retail is failing in many places. Uh, then one of my uh, favorite uh, softwares here is what's going on with artificial intelligence. Uh, this is another long-term thing that we can expect. A particular example that I've got up here uh, is uh, from uh, an office brainstorming session where they uh, were mapping on a whiteboard uh, various process and software components. They took a picture of it and then the AI wrote the code. Uh, to implement it. Oh, so they wow. skip several layers of employees uh, in, in developing this particular application. So uh, there's something I think worth footnoting for a later discussion is where, what, how do we think about adapting to a, AI and the applications there out? Okay, thanks. All right, so another couple of uh, long run kinds of issues that I, I think are, are worth considering. Uh, one is where we've been calling the silver tsunami, which is really an epic transition in the country's demography. What you see in the foreground is the population by age in the year 2000, uh, and, and then the, the slightly grayed out area behind it, uh, the projected change by age group to 2033. And so what you see is an upward shift in the population. We're getting older. Uh, and in the United States, that means that the population is growing faster than the labor force. So a lot of the factors that play into why we might have more AI deployed, why we might have more automation, th these are some of the background factors influencing those decisions. We go to the next one. On the other hand, South Florida is a little bit different. Uh, between 2000 and the projected 2033 population, labor force grows about the same rate as population. We actually have more younger people than uh, I would have normally have traditionally associated with South Florida in the past. So uh, it's a more complex picture here, and it actually is to our advantage in terms of thinking about what are competitive advantages in South Florida. Right. Next. All right, so this is more related to what you will find in the annual progress report. These are changes to uh, job openings uh, in the US. And that black line is the all industries change. So you can see things are, are sort of floating between five and 6% for all job openings. And then we have a few sectors that are outperforming uh, the others. Uh, information, professional services, and healthcare and education are faster growing uh, industries across the country. Next, now again, black line is is the uh, average of, of all job openings, and then the, the, all that noise around it are the mid-level performing industries, real estate, transportation, uh, arts and entertainment, uh, and uh, finance and accommodation. What's interesting about this is that these were the industries that were the strongest growing at the very end of COVID. So a lot of that uh, reopening has slacked off. And in some cases, uh, it's even reversed in some areas, like I think we'll see in Monroe County. All right, and then this is our low job openings. These are the ones that are lagging construction. I think it's one of the, the industries that we need to come back to and discuss. Uh, what's going on with that. Durable goods, uh, wholesale and retail trade are all slower than the average. And that we can also attribute that to some of the shifts in, in how commerce is, is undertaken these days. All right. Well, all right, all right. I'm gonna talk about the chart on the right, uh, just a, a, a little bit first. Uh, what you'll see on the uh, access going up is the, uh, uh, new jobs per new dwelling units uh, that are being built. Uh, and then the going across the, the X bar is the change in jobs over the last 10 years in percentages. So that the uh, metro areas, the one in blue is the, uh, our, our region, South Florida, uh, are among the fastest growing in terms of employment growth. Uh, and then uh, the other ones such as uh, DC are on the slower end, 
Uh, and then the, the metro areas that are slightly beneath uh, uh, the South Border region, uh, all are doing a better job of providing housing units than South Florida. So we're about mid-ranked for the country's largest 10 metros uh, in terms of uh, dwelling unit construction, um, but we are on, in, among the faster set in terms of, of growing jobs. Uh, so it's a little bit of a mixed bag. On the other hand, um, as you can see from the, the text, uh, again, just coming back to this whole uh, house price to income ratio, we, we score very poorly. Uh, and then um, the result of reopening and how people have uh, moved around in excess commuting has given us the fourth worst commute delay in the United States. And according to a... Um, I believe they're in Spanish firm as uh, so ranked our region as ninth in the world for the worst congestion. Uh, so continue. All right. So domestic migration, uh, Florida has been the, the top destination for domestic migrants, uh, people moving from, you know, from all over the rest of the United States to here. Uh, and then we're also the top destination for international migrants uh, by quite some distance, actually. Go to the next one. Uh, in terms of our year-to-year -year change in population, uh, which you'll see are the four counties that we would generally consider in this report, uh, all of our counties um, really are below 2020 levels. Uh, if you look at the percentage change by county, this is another index. On the right-hand side, you can see the red bar is Miami, uh, Dade or South Florida, and it, it's it's been declining. That decline is level off. On the other hand, we're still doing better than uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, which has really uh, seen a significant decline in recent years. And up at the top are our, our metro areas like Austin and uh, Phoenix uh, and that have done better. Um, another factor that we want to uh, focus on here is how tight the labor market is. This is another indicator of, of how well South Florida is doing, relatively speaking. And so what you'll see here is, this is called the JOLTS report, which is uh, uh, basically unemployed persons per job opening. And the blue line is, is Florida. Uh, so you can see we have fewer unemployed per uh, job opening, which means, again, that the labor market is uh, fairly tight with respect to the orange line, which is the United States. Uh, and this is likely to continue uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, and again, sort of calls up the, 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 uh, the importance of addressing wages. So if we come um, move on to the next one, in terms of relative uh, change and uh, industry employment. Uh, we have two graphs here, obviously. One is percent change, and then the other is uh, the uh, total or absolute change in jobs. Uh, in terms of absolute change, our highest growing industry was education and health services. But in terms of percentage growth, which is interesting, mm -hmm. that professional services and information are two highest or fastest growing industries. Professional services usually refers to small businesses. So it's it, it, it's your, your small business owners that you'll see some of which are in this mall. Uh, you're familiar with the mall uh, uh, from everyone from barber shops to accountants. Uh, then on information services, the blue bar is the loss of jobs in Broward County. Broward actually lost the information sector during this period um, and Palm Beach actually made up the great majority of the gain in jobs uh, in information which is uh, software uh, and, and other uh, types of data products. All right um, so we can go on to the next one. All right so a lot of this is now leading us to greater inequality across the United States. Um, what you see on the left here is that um, there has been some increase since the the initial drop, or we, we were on a downward path uh, until about 2020, and it's picked up slightly since, uh, and particularly in Monroe, but um, uh, also uh, across the state. Uh, on the other hand, some of our other counties are doing somewhat better. 
Uh, nevertheless, there's a stark difference between the mean and median income. So your middle income versus the average income. Clearly, there's a lot of people in South Florida who are making a lot more than the average person is uh, and, and um, the rest of the economy. And that has helped to propel uh, the stark uh, difference in the ratio of, of income to the average price of a home uh, where we now outpace uh, the New York metro area. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Herbalda to talk about uh, some of the other updates that I'm trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Um, I'll make this quick. It's This is part of um, the requirements uh, for the SEDS. We went through all the projects. We asked you to send us your projects that align with each of our goals. And for instance, we, um, uh, like Senator Geller said earlier, including your projects in our uh, uh, report, it's kind of like having a step to foot in for future grants for your programs. For instance, goal one, um, cultivate a competitive economy and foster economic mobility. We got multiple projects um, that fit either under boosting uh, um, uh, entrepreneurial development or investment in workforce development. For instance, NSU's uh, Levan Sanders um, Level 5 Space Dock ideated five founders, five startups, incubated five founders, and accelerated two founders and two startups. Investment in workforce development we received from OIC and Career Source Broward and NSU as well. Uh, for instance, what we were looking for was uh, outcomes. Your what what has been the impact in your communities because of these programs, right? So, for instance, Career Source um, uh, occupational skills training, adults and dislocated workers. They invested 3.5 million to 456 of the participants out of which 413 earned credentials, 216 of them, uh, they got employed at an average hourly wage of $25.26. And the same thing goes with all of the other goals that we've received. Um, mobility and access, for instance, the Brightline, uh, Brightline train service between Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm Beach, which now expanded to Orlando. Um, the train service has had a 6.5 uh, 4 billion direct economic impact to Florida's economy and committed to creating a sustaining uh, and sustaining over 2,000 jobs. Moving uh, next to goal three, design, construct, um, and maintain resilient infrastructure. If you have, uh, I know, uh, Dr. Baran, you're going to send me your, uh, your project. <laughs> I emailed you yesterday, so please do so, because I would love to include the FDP um, uh, uh, report, executive summary report that you submitted to the state uh, delineating sure. everything that you, yes. Perfect. <laughs> Forward yes. to you right now, and I was actually summarizing some points in an email to you that you're going to receive now as we are talking here. Great, you're so great. Thank you so much. Thank I you. appreciate it. So uh, same thing with uh, economic shocks, like the housing. We, as the council, uh, did the regional collaboration within um, the, the four mayors to um, talk about the issue of affordable housing, what's going on, which is native updates and, what's, and so on. And more uh, recently, like goal four, <laughs> promote regional collaboration, we, the council took the lead and to getting 100 stakeholders together for the regional tech hub. And we successfully got designated as a regional tech hub for climate tech. We submitted, yes. For submitted South Florida. Yeah. For yes. South Florida, yes, correct. Which means out of uh, 196 applications, 27 were awarded, we were one of them. This is, this is just phase one designation. Phase two is coming next year that we need to apply and only five to 10 will be selected. And we certainly hope to see uh, NOVA's uh, uh, program uh, get approved in the future, your medical hub. Yes, so right. There were two applications uh, from yeah. our region, one medical hub and one climate tech hub. Um, but I know that all the regional partners are working together, even though that with the medical team, I mean, medical team, the medical hub stakeholders, they're uh, continuing to collaborate and see, you know, uh, uh, creating partnerships. 
And that's about it. So if you have any last minute project that you would like to include in our annual update, please send them to me by the end of this week, maybe? Yes, <laughs> by the end of this week, Friday, uh, and we will include them in the report. All right, Randy, now I understand you're coming back up to, and now we're going to review Although I, some of these charts appear to be the same charts that you they read. are, we should. The, uh, right. most of what you saw in the PowerPoint presentation right. uh, is included in the report. There were a few charts that I threw in extra to help add context. Okay, so so we're going to run through this, then we're going to adopt this. All of you, everybody here has already been sent draft copies. This is, I think, the third meeting that we have had on this, on um, the update. So this one is to vote to adopt it, after which, please, we'll be done by 11. But I do want to spend uh, at least 15 or 20 minutes on what we're going to do next, because I regard that as an extremely important issue. And I see we've been joined by Carol Hilton. Carol, thank you for joining us. And uh, Randy. Take it away. All right, thank you. All right, so uh, just to kind of run you through the document uh, at a fairly brisk pace, uh, what we have are uh, just the highlights of some of what's changed in the past year in the executive summary. We uh, address the population um, boom, uh, but also how some of that has slackened off and even reversed in a few places. Uh, the fact that uh, South Florida continues to outperform uh, the state and much of the rest of the country. And By the way, I, I know the reason that our population move is insurance and housing costs. Yes. People can't afford to live here. There you go. Yeah, they, they do move out. And when they right. do move, they move to other parts of Florida. Right. So, um, and then again, we, we've been outperforming the rest of the country on, on, on employment. Um, labor force participation rate, this is something I didn't address in the PowerPoint, but it is a very important uh, factor in our competitiveness internationally because we have fewer and fewer people who are working versus the population uh, that lives here. And so, the, which we'll call the dependency ratio, there are more people who are reliant on people who are working uh, for support if it continues to grow. Um, uh, then we have on page six uh, a map of the unemployment rate by state. Uh, uh, and county uh, in Florida, and as you can see, again, uh, not to continually belabor the point, but then it's sort of the next page about what our unemployment rate is. Uh, same goes for page eight, and then as I noted on page nine, the um, labor market continues to be tight and is likely to continue, especially as we see an ever growing leap of retirements by older workers, which uh, is another point to raise. Um, pages 10, 11, and 12 are the slides that I uh, showed on uh, job openings, uh, which is the increase in jobs and in, by industry that you, you've all just saw. Um, and then pages 13 and 14 are the changes in employment by industry, first by percentage change and then by absolute numbers. And then on page 15 is one of the um, uh, slides I didn't directly address, which is the change in average weekly wage, which is, again, South Florida, is uh, outperforming the U.S. and much of the rest of the state. Uh, on the other hand, it is simply not uh, keeping up with the cost of living. Um, income inequality, uh, I did address this in the PowerPoint on pages 16 and 17. Uh, and that kind of takes us to the end of the graphics. And then the rest of the document uh, consists of a more detailed breakout of what your all are provided in terms of input on projects. And again, the progress report is very important because it helps uh, select further um, uh, scoring uh, by EDA on potential project uh, funding in the future. Okay. I believe that we're ready for discussion and a vote um, on this part. Um, again, we are required to send to EDA. We are the EDD. We are required to send to the EDA the update. Uh, this has been shared in draft uh, 
format previously with everybody. Uh, is there any discussion on this? Any comment? Uh, any final suggestions for changes before I ask for a motion to adopt? Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, is there a motion to adopt this or actually it has to be adopted by the South Florida Regional Planning Council. Well, by here, right. and then we'll take it. Right. Place. So, uh, uh, the actual motion would be a recommendation of the said committee to approve it with final approval from the SFRPC. Is there a motion, Doctor Hanbury? I move. Okay. Yeah, that, uh, second. Moved by Doctor Hanbury, seconded by Carol Houghton. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of recommending adoption of this annual, the 2023 annual progress report, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Show it adopted unanimously. Now, while I have everybody here, I want to talk about the next thing, which I think is very important. Um, this is, I think, think the current list of who's on this and that's there uh, on the SEDS committee. There's a lot of people that we need to get back on because, for example, I think that South Florida Hospital um, Association, um, I think they just changed. changed you know, their chair changed. Yeah, their chair changed. I don't think we have anybody here from the Dade or Broward League of Cities because they change every year. So we had more members and we need to get them back on. But we already have on here the South Florida Water Management District Career Source Broward Workshop. Um, uh, the well, again, this was the Dade County League of Cities, the SFRPC, the South Florida Regional Transit Authority. Oh, we have Yes, uh, David's here. Nelson Fernandez from ANF Construction, which is the largest minority construction uh, company, I believe, in the state. Um, an all around good guy, the Dade Beacon Camp, Miami Dade Beacon Council, uh, the New Urban Development, Miami Urban League, College of the Florida Keys, Nova Southeastern, Career Source. Miami Dade College, um, Broward County, actually, Dan Reynolds is now the state president of AFL CIO mm -hmm. instead of the local president, Steve Hudson, uh, the Greater Marathon Chamber of Commerce, OIC, South Florida Hospital Association. Uh, Bob Swindell was at our last meeting in person. Uh, they have a, a conflict uh, with Greater mm -hmm. Fort Lauderdale Alliance, Enterprise Florida, BBX Capital. Um, John Wenstein, who's uh, Nova, uh, the Levan Center. Uh, again, we, there's uh, Juliet Ruak was on this. We have so many of the major leaders in South Florida uh, from education, business, healthcare, uh, government that I was reluctant to just let this group dissolve. So we decided that we should take up a topic and work on it for the next year with uh, presumably four meetings. And then this could turn into a conference we haven't decided yet. Uh, we asked for input. Some of the issues which were interesting were um, that did not make the final list were the issue of uh, windstorm insurance, uh, we uh, Randy discussed AI. I have to tell you, it terrifies me. And I, my undergraduate degree is history. I can tell you that in the past, when you've had new technology, the people that it's put out of business were the lower level workers. Today, what I believe AI is going to do is in the next 10, 10 years from now, not yet, it will eliminate 60% of the lawyers and making up percentages, 70% uh, of architects and engineers, uh, financial planners, stock analysts, uh, accountants, people that today are the top 20% of the economic food chain. And 
I don't, as a history major, I don't remember this ever happening before. And I don't know what's going to happen uh, when a lot, so many of our white collar jobs go out of existence, but I fear that they will. Um, and I don't know what they will be replaced with, but we'll see. But what we decided after having two meetings to discuss this, we narrowed it to three topics. One would be affordable housing, the second would be mass transit, and the third would be infrastructure. In many cases, these will overlap. So today we will take a vote on which of these three we should adopt. And I hope that all of you have the document in front of you, but I assume most of you don't. So I will just read. If we're going to go on affordable housing, the areas that we have looked at include inclusionary zoning and other land use regulations, such as live local or here in Broward, the Geller Amendment and incentives. Secondly, use of public dollars, optimizing allocations for gap financing, purchase assistance versus subsidies for rentals or neighborhood improvements, because you can put the affordable housing money into any of those three areas. Um, it's not listed here, but as you everybody knows with the um, issue where the state of Florida correctly required condominiums to bring themselves current, that is going to potentially lead to a new wave of homelessness when people that have been waiving their statutory reserves for 30 or 40 years in a condominium and now instead of because they've been waiving their reserves, they now have massive repairs due and no money to pay for them. So that is, I don't know that we can deal with that, but that's another issue that plays into affordable housing. Um, again, transit-oriented development is a, a major biggie. Collaborative efforts with the private sector to enhance wages and expand affordable housing stock. Remember, unaffordability is measured as a percentage of income. So if you increase income, you're reducing uh, the level of unaffordability of housing. And I think most of you have heard me say my biggest priority as county commissioner has been bringing more high paid jobs to Broward and then any other topics which would come up. So that's the uh, affordable housing option. Option two is mass transit, which would also deal with transit oriented development, but would also deal with first and last mile solutions, exploring funding sources, local, state, federal, investment and implement and implementation strategies for rail, rapid bus, emerging transportation technology, you know, air taxis, things of that nature. We want to make sure that what we're building now deals with future means of technology. Uh, down here in South Florida, because of our flooding, I think that should include boats to get from where you're going or submarines since we'll all be underwater. Um, expanding mobility on demand and micro mobility beyond the downtown areas. We need the mobility on demand and micro mobility for the first and last miles, but we may want this in other areas. And also how do you get to your, uh, if you're gonna be taking mass transit, uh, if you're not gonna have the large parking rides, which I don't think we're gonna have, we're gonna need to do something. <laughs> Uh, prioritizing sustainability with a focus on zero emissions slash electric vehicles. You know, are electric vehicles necessarily the wave of the future? Could it end up being hydrogen? Could it end up being, you know, other things? You know, we don't know the charging. We're starting to see a political blowback against electric vehicles. Uh, and then any other ideas. And the last item so we're going to vote and want to adopt one of these three. First one was affordable housing. Second is mass transit. And the third is infrastructure, which again, overlaps heavily with mass transit, but it, it also deals with 
addressing infrastructure be water, storm water, solid waste and recycling challenges. If you all missed last Friday, the South Florida Regional Planning Council and the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council hosted a major, extremely educational program on recycling. If you'd like to, if you have nothing else to do and you <laughs> want to watch our six hour meeting, uh, it is on our website uh, and it's extremely informative, but I know we're all busy. Um, we're preparing a summary. Yeah. Meetings, so. um, and secondly, under infrastructure, identifying funding opportunities and strategies, which was also the mass transit above. Uh, third is ensuring the maintenance of critical infrastructure. I can tell you, I was elected to the legislature in 88. I've been doing this a very long time. It is simply not sexy or something that you go home and brag about and say, hey, I put $50 million into maintaining roads and bridges. What is sexy? You say, oh, I got this new road built or I we put in this new rail line or or... But if we ignore maintenance on all of our infrastructure, which includes transit, but also includes um, so many other things uh, uh, pertaining here in South Florida to water and other noteworthy consider uh, other no noteworthy topics, one thing that I think you know we'll end up with, I think any of you who have been to these meetings before have heard me say that. Uh, Right now, the city is called Fort Lauderdale, but I'm afraid in 15 years it will be called Fort Underwaterdale um, <laughs> because not because of sea level rise, although that is a problem, but sea level rise will prevent us from draining when it rains because we drain through all of these canals that were built in the 40s and 50s, but they're all gravity fed. And, you know, we remember what happened, uh, what, six, eight months ago when we had 22 inches of rain and everything was underwater. Uh, that's going to be the norm in 13 or 14 years unless we're able to get our projects built. We know how to fix it, but they're not funded and they're not authorized and it has to be led by Army Corps. So that would also be under infrastructure. So... I would like some discussion. Again, I will remind you, we are going to vote on which of these three topics we want to explore. What I would envision us doing is similar to the SEDS. Many of you appointed your, if you're a university president, you appointed a provost or a vice president to deal with specific issues or topics where we had subcommittee meetings. Uh, I would anticipate that we would have subcommittee meetings, perhaps once a month, with the actual SEDS committee meeting quarterly three times and then four times to adopt the final report. And again, we may end up, and I think there's a reasonably good chance that when we have come up with a product, we will turn that into a major conference a South Florida conference because so, we have so many leaders here that have it. I mean, I, I'm just in awe of the lead, of the membership of this committee. So that's what we're looking at doing. We're now going to have a discussion as to which of these three. I will tell you the last time we voted, uh, the in order, the number one was uh, affordable housing, number two was mass transit, number three was infrastructure. We had like eight topics. These were the top three in that order, but today we will be voting as to which of these three we wish to, we wish to we do. Want to focus on the right? Then, well, not necessarily today, but then we're going to discuss the subtopics. So, uh, Mr. President, I don't know if you're scratching or if you're trying to comment. About which of these three would well, you like? I, I was doing both. Uh, thanks. I, uh, I, I think uh, transportation is you can combine all three of those with transportation. Uh, 
uh, infrastructure upgrade it needs you've got to have the infrastructure upgrade to support the transportation and then also if you especially if you do east west transportation and not just north south you will also address affordable housing so i think if we address mass transit you will, you will be you will be hitting all three in one but uh that's just my suggestion so as i said there's a lot of overlap between those with your permission i think that we will change if we go with mass transit will strike the word mass and just go with transit which would include mass transit but would also include the micro mobility and other things that you need to make mass transit work so um all right additional comments um don't make me call on you because i will so yes uh, carol Yes, um, I, I agree. Affordable housing, when you talked about the subcategories, is really very important. One is bringing the high wage, but the other is also up, up lifting the people who are currently here so that they can also get the higher wage jobs. But transit is also an issue in South Florida, and the president is uh, uh, spot on uh, going, which is a hospitality um, area, and that, that going from east to west is something that needs a concentrated effort so that people can get to their job because not everyone has a car and the buses don't always run in that straight line that's needed. So I do believe that um, transit is going to help with the workforce. And if, if we are working, focusing also and you're folding in uh, affordable housing, I think we need to bring um, Sandra Einhorn and or Senator Nan Rich, because I know they're working a lot with respect to the affordable housing. So they would be a key component to pull into this as well. Okay, so what I'm starting to hear, but I, I'm gonna ask each of you to, to comment. What I'm starting to hear would be something on combining housing and transit. So we would be focusing on housing um, and uh, but particular with transit oriented development and also when you're looking at people's budgets typically the most expensive item is housing and the second most is transit so you know we could be talking about basically combining leaving out a couple of the housing and a couple of the transit but coming up with one combined topic Steve what do you think by the way, remember, we have to look at this not just from a Broward County perspective. So, you know, Steve, Carol, and, and George, you're, you're all from Broward. Remember, this is Dade, Broward, Monroe. So I don't know if my, if Dade has the same east-west issues yeah, as, as Broward does. So, Steve? Well, I'm my personal transportation uh, throughout the, the Tri-County area um, – you know, is I don't, it's it's tough. I think both of both uh, transportation and affordable housing or housing affordability, as Broward Workshop um, has kind of deemed it, um, are both um, kind of impediments to the region. You know, and we look back to uh, when Amazon was here, uh, looking around. So they are interconnected. Um, I my my personal, I think transportation comes one and affordable. Uh, housing next, but they're they're neck and neck. Okay, thank you, David. Yeah, it's. I mean, uh, echoing the previous statements, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody what I say. But the uh, you know, transportation um, and the uh, the transit oriented developments come with it. I think the key though is is working with Tallahassee to get an exclusion from the live local for transit oriented developments, um, so that that doesn't trigger. You know, there triggers a lot of fear if you start putting up. Right. For development, and then you know you have the mile radius. So you know we, we need to have some work done uh, there to exempt TOD from uh, from live local, and then uh, then we can start building you know TODs, robust TODs around any stations, whether they be light rail, e east west light rail as part of the Broward plan. Uh, you got the smart program down in Miami. So either way, you need to kind of take those restrictions off the TODs in order to make them work. 
Okay, by the way, you've raised an issue that I have never previously thought of. Here's the problem. If you've got one mile, well, let's say you have density in downtown or Lauderdale, and then you go one mile out of that, um, and you get, you know, because downtown you're building 45 stories, so you build 45 stories a mile further away. Well, now you've got another building that's 45 stories. Can you now go another mile out based on the one that you built under Live Local? Under that case, Live Local oh could eventually spread to the entire county just based on the other Live Local building. So that that would be interesting. Yeah. I think that's some of the apprehension around the, the TODs around the train stations and bus stations is 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 you know what that does with live local. And there's I know there's been a conversation in Palm Beach County uh uh the other day, and I know there's conversations in Miami about uh as you know working with legislatures for an exemption for TOD. Well, I actually chair the community and urban affairs committee of Florida Association of Counties. And this is one, both of the community affairs is growth management and urban affairs is the larger county. So both of them are in the committee I chair. So I'm going to bring this up at our Florida Association of Counties legislative meeting in 10 days. Uh, Daniel, your thoughts. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I actually tend to agree with <clears throat> most everyone else. The transportation mobility for me is number one. You know, we're at the end of the road here down in Monroe County. You know, at the bottom, um, we're out of building allocations, basically, which are given to us by the state of Florida, as you know, in a critical area state of concern. So we literally almost cannot build a whole lot of a whole lot more of uh, affordable housing, let alone just market rate residential housing. So we're very unique. Uh, so for us, transportation and uh, unique forms of transportation, like I've mentioned in the past, whether it's air taxis and whatnot, are key for us to bring workers in because we can't build too many more homes and apartments for them and i think for you all too it allows for some additional sprawling and uh, for people who can live in more affordable areas and commute in to downtown miami fort lauderdale you know those other areas that are just becoming some of the most expensive uh, real estate in the country now um, including the, the florida keys so transportation for us i think is is number one where we can move people effectively um, utilizing newer technologies too, and not just the old ways of doing it or working, you know, expanding certain highways, adding a lane here and there, you know, right when they're cutting the ribbon on it, it's already maxed out again, and we need more room, more space, more, more capacity. So we need to think outside the box there, and I'm excited to, uh, to go down that path because I think it, it lends itself to that. And on the infrastructure, obviously it's important. I think it's getting its due as it should, you know, with the state and, and nationally with sea level rise, um, as is housing in addition. So those things are still going to get worked on um, just it, because we don't choose it, you know, today. So I'm confident they'll still get their funding and fair share. But transportation mobility for me, numero uno. Gracias. What I think I've heard, and please feel free to correct me, is that we should be doing a hybrid primarily dealing with transit but a lot of that dealing with the housing components of that such as transit oriented development you know the first and last mile solutions new forms of uh, potential transit as you mentioned the potential for air taxi things like that uh, but also working with the uh, zoning regulations, part of TOD, but things like the Live Local Act to ensure that we can do the local TOD without scaring people. So we will not deal with all areas of transit because it's too big of an issue anyhow, but we'll deal primarily with transit, but look at it also from a housing perspective, although not limited to a housing perspective. So I think the biggest focus would be on uh, transit-oriented development, how to go east-west, things like that, so that you can put the housing and the jobs, uh, connect the housing and the jobs, fix, try and fix the live local area, um, 
that would also have to involve the first and last mile because you can't get mass transit working without that. Does that, and again, we'll have to draft this, but does that generally sound like what people here are describing? If so, I'm going to ask for a motion on that to approve that as our project. Moved by David Deck, seconded by Carol Hilton. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Show it adopted unanimously. Now, what I'm going to need y'all to do, first, when we have this, we're now going to schedule another meeting with more notice. Unfortunately, we've had to change the meeting. We're going to send a doodle poll so we can know what the best time is for us to be having meetings so we can schedule them way in advance so we can have, you know, our traditional 15 or 20 people attending right. as opposed to the much smaller attendance here. Um, I'm going to ask, as we develop some of these subtopics, we're going to ask each of you, if you have somebody, because I know how busy you all are, that you can appoint somebody, and maybe it'll be more than one on different subcommittees, we will probably create two or three subcommittees, one perhaps specifically on TOD, one perhaps specifically on first and last mile, one perhaps specifically on fixing live local. I, we don't know yet, but we probably will have three or four subcommittees. So I'm hoping that each of you will start to think about who in your organization you can appoint to serve on each of these subcommittees. We hope the subcommittees will meet monthly. Um, and then with, with this group, the larger group meeting quarterly, we will decide nine months from now if we want to have a conference based on this or what we want to do with the results. Um, one last thing I wanted to close with is uh, my, I'm past national president of the National Conference of Insurance Legislators. Um, I'm known as an expert on insurance. I think windstorm insurance rates are, I hear more about that from my constituents than any other issue. I am working on a plan which I expect to roll out this calendar year in the next six weeks. Um, if anybody would like to either work with me or be with me when we present it. Uh, uh, I'll give you the short, please don't discuss this until I'm ready to reveal it publicly, but the majority of the problem that we have here is, is reinsurance. Rein, reinsurers are regulated by the same people that regulate OPEC, uh, which is God only. Nobody regulates the reinsurers. They are not required to charge actuarially sound rates. If there's a earthquake in Italy, they can say, all right, we need more money. So jack up windstorm rates in Florida. Uh, roughly 50 to 60% of the total premium for windstorm insurance goes directly to reinsurance. And they're just not actuarially sound rates. I have a plan to dramatically reduce these rates. So if anybody, um, Mr. President, I, I, I don't know if this particular interest to Carol or David, it may be to Daniel, Steve, and, and President Hanbury. So if anybody is interested, please let me know and I'll make sure we include you when we roll this out. Okay, so let me know if you are. And is there anything else? It's about 11. I said we'd be done at 11. Is there anything else that we need to do now before we adjourn? Do any of you have any comments that you want to make before we adjourn? If not, please show us. I don't have a gavel, so I'll bang my phone. <laughs> adjourn. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Okay.